Dude, it's an honor to have you on, and and not only that, but to meet you, and you know, in this virtual environment, as well as uh, get to know a little bit more about you. Yeah, man. Likewise, I watch you, and I'm like, this guy is something else, man. <laughs> I'm just moving, bro. That's, you know, I that's got what it, uh, that's what it takes. It, it, it's one of those things where it's uh, like my good friend Andy states it. You know, if I don't do it, somebody else is. So that's right. It might as well get, might as well get to work. So, um, can we just jump right in? Yeah, let's jump right in. And excuse the the scenery. I'm actually getting married next week, so we're uh, I'm out of LA this week. So I'm uh, thank you, man. So I'm not at the uh, at the office this week. I'm I'm getting everything coordinated, and then I'm closing on my house here in Bel Air. So we got to do the final walkthrough. So I'm out in LA today. So I'm not in my okay. my Temecula home base. Uh, excellent. So. Um, so let's get let's, let's start here so that people kind of get a little bit of background. So like, where'd you yeah. grow up? What's your background? And then I really want to get into how you built what you built and then your thought process now. But starting off, yeah, who is Miguel Aguilar? Yeah. So I'm from Riverside, California. I was born in uh, 1981. I'm from the hood, dude. Just plain and simple. You know, I've had a very uh, rough upbringing, very rare, very rough childhood. Uh, I was abused by my mom uh, physically. I was also um, uh, tortured by my mother, uh, you know, me and my younger brother, all the way up till we're about 12. And then at 12 years old, my mom abandoned us and left us with my father. But my father, he had nothing, he didn't want nothing to do with us. So he actually left a year prior when I was about 11, disappeared. Come to find out, he had another, you know, lady pregnant, got a whole, had a whole nother life. Then they finally reconnected, and when we relinked up, and we decided that we we're going to stay with them for a little bit while my mother got her stuff together, and so she said she would come back and get us, and she never did, so she disappeared. But then you fast forward twenty seven years later, she reappeared uh, again, which that's a whole another story. Um, and then my father, you know, from the age of twelve to sixteen, he, he raised us. Uh, and he was a drug addict, alcoholic. So I had a very upbring, a rough upbringing with that as well. So it's one of those things where the only male bonding I had was having a talk hand with my dad at the age of twelve, and that was what we thought was normal. You know, we we didn't think anything different of it because it just it felt so normal being able to go to the park or go to the beach with our dad. He would go to 7-Eleven, get a Foster's tall can. He would get me and my brother a Budweiser tall can and me and my brother would split it. And then we get nachos. And, you know, so that was like the norm. Um, that was know, your life. Really? That was my life, dude. So I knew I knew yeah. no different. And um, and of course, you're 12 years old. You're thinking, cool, I'm drinking with pops. Yeah. Um, come to find out, you know, now that I have two young daughters myself, there's no way I would ever do that with my kids at 12. Well, we're going to get, um, we're going to get into that because I kind of knew some of this and I wanted to, uh, you know, and that whole thing, fucked up parents create fucked up kids that create fucked up yeah. adults that create fucked up parents and the cycle continues and, and you broke the cycle. Like you broke it. That was, dude, and, at the age of like, that was ahead. my main objective. You know, one of my main objectives was to break that cycle. It was not to fall into that trap of repeating what that life history was with my background, right? Yeah. I wasn't, uh, I, I didn't become uh, a victim. I didn't become a product of my environment. But one of the many blessings of that was getting out of the environment to truly see what the world looked like. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I'm from Riverside, California. I was from Casablanca, in between Casablanca and Lanza. Uh, I mean, gang banging drug dealing, the whole deal all the way up to 16. My dad got uh, incarcerated. They, they gave him a sentence of 22 years into Hatchapi State Prison. And when they sentenced him, my stepmom, who also disliked us very heavily, like truly hated us, like would hide food from us. We would come home from school, didn't have nothing to eat. She would have like the loaf of bread and the cereal, like tucked into her closet, locked room. Um, really fucked up, dude, to really treat teenagers that way. Uh, two young growing boys. I got luckily one of the blessings at the age of 14, I got into wrestling, uh, not knowing that that was going to save my life multiple times. And so at 16, when my dad got incarcerated, um, my stepmom kicked us out and literally came home from wrestling practice one day and she, you know, wouldn't answer the door. Things were locked up. 
key didn't work. Uh, she finally opens the door and, you know, we have our tr black trash bags. I remember like it was yesterday, trash black, back, uh, black trash bags right by the door. And we're like, well, what's going on? She was like, well, you guys can't stay here anymore. I was like, what do you mean we can't stay here anymore? She was like, yeah, you guys can't stay here. So you guys got to figure out where to go. And I was like, what are we supposed to do? She was like, figure it out. And how, and like, and how old were you? 16 and my brother was 15. So and you we've showed been up. To, in the you system. showed up together. You this event. You guys yeah. were on the porch yeah. together. Uh, on the porch, yeah. Because my brother could. Shit, we we literally lived in the hood, dude. So we would walk home together because I would get. So I stopped when I got into when I was twelve years old. There's a picture that I just showed my fiance not too long ago. Um, the day that I got dropped off with my dad, uh, we took a picture. It was me, my brother, my dad, and my now uh, half sister that I didn't know I had a half sister, you know, that was like all, all brand new within that day. And we get dropped off and we go to my dad's and his now, you know, girlfriend, soon to be wife, uh, a two bedroom apartment in Riverside off of Magnolia. And uh, literally, and she already had this lady already had two other daughters prior to that. So there's five kids, two adults in the two bedroom apartment. Of course, me and my brother got the floor uh, in the living room or the couch, and we alternated every other night. We would, you know, swap out. Uh, but that day, I remember we took a picture in front of the pool. There's a community pool in the an apartment complex, and I was wearing a, a Marvel T-shirt, my San Diego Chargers hat, bent over Bill, just a normal twelve year old kid, you know, yeah. normal twelve year old kid, just like still was into baseball, like I was into comic books, you know, a, a kid. A true kid and then literally i have another picture six months later uh that i took at school and i'm all gang banged out you know i did my first hardcore drug at 12 i did meth for the first yeah. time a product of my environment you know and yeah. that felt like family they accepted me i also had at that oh, point i know man i did the both, same thing uh, you know a lot 11, of aggression bro like 11 11 years old i was looking for a tribe and these uh older these older kids offered me that tribe and that tribe yeah, was a, and that did. tribe was a gang yeah and they're yeah. it's like they're hunting they're hunting it's, for that particular person right that right that right at, kid they look they look at the people that have and i i don't know if they <laughs> it's strategic on their part but they know you know and then birds of a feather flock together like misery love company so they want to fuck up life they want fucked up people with them that's what they're going to create yeah. So I got into that. Literally, I had that side by side picture, and I was like, "Dude, I dramatically changed in a matter of six months." And then from there, it was just a downfall. I was game banging, I was dope dealing, I was doing all kinds of stuff. And then at sixteen, um, my dad got incarcerated. So I, I, it was like a literally like my back was against the wall, and I was the man of the house at this point. I was the one that was going to take care of my brother. What do we do? First thing was like, I can't tell nobody. Because we've been in the system before when my mother got locked up. Uh, we're about nine, 10 years old. We went into the system. Dad got us in and out of the system. Um, so I know that that life I didn't want for me and my brother. And I was like, fuck this. I'm never going back to something like that. So I told my brother, hey, pack, let's grab the shit, put him in the car. Luckily, um, at 16, my freshman year, so this was already going into my junior year, so sophomore going into my junior year, I've always been a hustler. So I, I, I had poor parents, uh, but I wanted nice things. So I would throw either uh, parties in people's backyards and charge $5 at the door. I'd go get all, you know, the three kegs and then get everybody their solo cup. Here's five bucks. So I did that for a few times. And I bought my very first car with those, that, those funds. I bought me a 1972 Camaro. Uh, and um, so I had that car. That was a blessing in itself at that time because my dad didn't buy it for me. No, no, one, no one got me any. Everything was earned at that point, you know? And uh, so we packed it up, dude. And I remember we went to, there's this uh, gas station called the Fast Strip. It's on Arlington and Tyler in Riverside. And it's right by Norte Vista High School. That's where I went. Payphones were still around, you know? So <laughs> we went to the payphone, gathered as many quarters as we could. And I remember I was just calling all my friends, anybody that I had the number. I was like, yo, my parents are out of town. They went on vacation and, and we don't want to stay home alone. Is it, is it okay if we crash? And I was like, oh yeah, cool, cool. And let me ask my mom and dad. Cool, they go ask. It's a school night. No, you know, so we got, got so many no's. By nine o'clock, parents are then answering the phone, hanging up on us. And so I was like, finally, I was like, Julio, you know, get in the car. So we ended up, I remember uh, during wrestling practice, 
I have the fear of snakes. I hate snakes. I, I just don't know why. I just hate them. Uh, and there's the running trails that we'd always run right as spring hit and getting into summer, those snakes would pop out and they'd be on our running trail. So I'd, I'd always remember, shit, if we run down this trail, at least if something happens, or I would always picture a fucking snake jumping out and biting me in the ankle, you know? And so I was like, as long as if that does happen, because when we're running, everybody's off. And usually I'm always either in the front or I'm right slightly right behind the guy in the front. So I was always in front. We were separated from each other from everybody else. So if something happened, there's residential properties next door that I can either run to or scream loud enough for help if that happened. So I remembered that. I was like, well, shit. And of course, we didn't want to, you know, sleep in the car. That was like, we've never fucking had to do that. And we didn't want to get hurt we didn't we didn't know what could happen right so i was like i remember that so i remember we went down that back alleyway parked there right along the fence and no one could really see us uh, i was a brick wall and then the residential and then the running trails and that's where we spent the night the first night you know we did that for about eight months uh and then luckily my assistant wrestling coach chris gillespie which i still talk to today he actually owns one of my franchises in uh in san diego bless his heart dude he found out what was going on because I went from a 160 pound kid athletic because I was really heavy overweight. My dad owned a bunch of yum, yum donut franchises. So <laughs> breakfast was <laughs> like, you know, it was literally apple fritters and, and uh, Nestle quick milk dude, every morning. Um, so I was a really heavy overweight kid. So I got into wrestling and that helped a lot. And um, when, you know, I ended up getting super in shape my freshman year by sophomore, junior year, going into my junior year. I was a, a really athletic kid, and that's because of wrestling. And I went from 160-pound competitor down to 135, 140. So 20 pounds within, you know, eight-month period. And my coach was like, what the fuck's going on? And I was like, oh, I'm cutting weight. I'm cutting weight. You know, that's all I would say because it was a good excuse. I was cutting weight. And literally, you know, I, I remember – his face just something caught on with him and then he ended up finding out through my best friend at the time marvin that i was living on the streets and i told my friend because i was like hey you know if you can help me here and there that'd be great but everybody kept it a secret which was really cool that's like the brotherhood that's why I, that became my family my wrestling family and um he ended up my assistant wrestling coach he graduated in 97 and he was like my mentor in wrestling he would be the one that would beat the living shit out of me because he was a senior and, and rough me up to toughen me up in the sport. And he wouldn't take it lightly on me because I was, you know, I was, I was very strong as a young kid already, very competitive. I was wrestling varsity my freshman year, uh, won CIF my freshman year. So he was the one that literally put me under his wing. And then so he graduated and he came back. He came back to do assistant coaching. Uh, so he ended up. Uh, not really being hired by the school, but somewhat, you know, so he wasn't a teacher. So he felt obligated to ask his dad if I can spend the night at his house, if I can stay there for a while until I got on my feet. And luckily the dad said yes. And he came to me after practice one day, hey, Miguel, you can stay with us, like if you're okay. But the only problem is, is you have, you know, I can, we can help you, but unfortunately your brother, it, does he have anywhere to go? So then me and my brother connected and we're like, hey, do you got anywhere? I was like, yeah, my buddy Teddy and Steve uh, said they, they can take care of me. And I was like, oh, shit. In back of my head, I was like, uh, that's not a good idea. You know, Teddy and Steve, bless their heart that they're willing to help the, my brother out as well. But that family, they did drugs. They partied. They lived literally around the corner from our old house that we got kicked out of. So w I knew that demographic wouldn't be good. But also at the same time, we had no other options. And literally, dude, we were we were scrounging for food. We were uh, barely making it by. My brother threatened to to drop out of school multiple times because I made him go to school for those eight months. I, and I went to school. We would shower at Valley's Total Fitness uh, gym because I had a gym membership there for the sauna. And so I would pretend to go work out, shower there, go to school. That was our shower, you know. And and no one ever thought anything of it because I used to do that prior to because when I wrestled. You know, during wrestling season, I'd use the sauna because that was the only closest place that had the sauna. And um, so, yeah, I did that, dude. And, and we ended up going the path. I uh, barely graduated high school. I was trying to get a scholarship uh, during, uh, during high school. I ended up going to state. I ended up uh, beating the number one seat in state uh, in a double overtime match. The very first minute in the round, I was already up 8-0. And I ended up snapping my ankle. It like literally popped. Oh, and all you, you hear it. 
Yeah, dude. It was like, I heard it and I was like, oh, fuck. And I collapsed and they stopped it. And then they pulled me off the side. It's like, what are you going to do? And I told my coach, I was like, just tape it up, tape it up, tape it up. I was like, up eight, nothing. I was like, tape it up, tape it up. And there's a cool article on the press enterprise that they did. I, I have a scrapbook. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. But um, I told him, just tape it up and l- let's see what it is. It could be just a small sprain, whatever, just tape it up. But I was in so much pain. But I tried not to show it. I was just just holding it in because I didn't want them to call the match. We go back in and <laughs> fuck it, we caught up. We were tied, you know. And so we go into overtime because I was literally wrestling off of my knee, trying to put no pressure on it, limping around, but just going through the match. Double overtime. I go. Uh, I get on top. He chooses bottom. I get on top. I mount him, and I'm just riding the shit out of him, bro. He ain't going. He ain't going nowhere. <laughs> just tuck him, tuck him. Match goes in double overtime. So now I'm at the bottom. And I was known to always escape at the bottom. I was always known I had a very good move. I tucked myself in and roll over and I got out. So I ended up winning in double overtime uh, that match. They rushed me directly to the emergency room and it was so swollen they couldn't even do the x-rays. So they're like, unfortunately, we have to we have to pull you. And I was like, fuck, dude, I started bawling. I don't think I've ever yeah. bawled so hard in my life. Because that was my ticket out. I feel this. Dude, I was like balling, balling. And I was like, dude, I was trying to go to Cal State Fullerton. They were looking at me. And if you know wrestling, it's not like football. It's not like baseball. Scholarships don't come easy. Uh, You have to go to state. You have to win state, at least qualify nationals. Right. And so um, I had to call it, dude. And that was my senior year. And I was like, fuck, I'm already – this is by then. By this time, dude, I was already – Working a full time job, I was 18. My senior year, I turned 18. I was able to get a job at homegrocer.com working graveyard. Luckily, I did summer school all years prior, and I didn't do summer school because I was looking for further my education. I did summer school because they fed you lunch. So I was like, I get to eat during the summer. I'm gonna go get some classes out of the way, and then um, ended up only having four classes my senior year. So I worked literally from midnight till 10 in the morning in Fullerton, drive an hour hour 10 minutes make it to school by my 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 uh fourth period literally I, this i was already up almost 15 16 hours you know graveyard and dude i did that for my almost like half my senior year and it was it was it was wild and for me to uh still go to wrestling practice still compete at a competitive level operate off of three, four hours of sleep, not because I wanted, just because I had to, I had to survive. By then I had my own apartment, my senior year in high school. And by then I literally figured things out. I didn't turn, I didn't drop out. Unfortunately, my brother did drop out of high school. He didn't graduate high school. So you can see how that demographic can change the people's you know, life. It can make them do decisions that, that that's all they know. And for me, yeah. I got a little taste of what a, a normal household was. And that's yeah. when I started realizing like, dude, this is not what I want for myself. Uh, I got out of gang banging. I decided to to change my life around to a certain degree, but then I also fell trapped to my vicious family cycle. You yeah. know, I got into drugs and alcohol heavily. I was a very functioning drug addict, alcoholic for a very, very long time. Uh, I'm very blessed to say I got, you know, almost eight years sobriety now. June 19th of this year would be my eighth year. Congratulations. And thank you, man. Um, so it's it's one of those things where, all the things that happened to me through high school is something that, uh, or even middle school to high school, it's something that I wanted to change from day one. And the reason I said to get back to the uh, newspaper article, for some reason, since the age of 12, since the day I got dropped off, and this is the reason why we took the picture in the front, I wanted that picture because I wanted to remember this. I've always been the type of person that I wanted to document everything in my life. And I knew that I was going to do something in my life. Didn't know what. And I also knew that my story, for some reason, it's almost like a movie um, because it's it, you would not believe some of the things that I went through. You know, my mom faked my own death. My mom tortured me. She would let she would literally we got in trouble. She would put a single sheet of newspaper down, a single sheet, a single uh, like layer of uh, rice, white rice, and she would make us kneel. And if our butt touched our heels, she would beat us with a spatula. She would beat us, whatever. And she would, I literally have scars on my knees from the rice being embedded into my skin, you know? So that's the life that I lived. So from the age of 12 
I started documenting things, keeping things that would remember certain things. So if I ever told this story, people would see that it, this is not fabricated for some reason. So I have a, like on my Facebook account, I have a photo album called Oldies But Goodies. And you'll see the newspaper article on there. You'll see that in my senior year in high school, I finally was able able to open up to a counselor because I was 18. And at that point, they couldn't they couldn't tell me right. I couldn't go to school. Right. So so I opened up to a counselor. And, um, and at this point, I knew I didn't get a scholarship. I got a partial to Cerritos. But even then, I had to pass that up because um, I couldn't afford housing. You know, I couldn't afford to work full time, go to school full time and housing. There's just no possible way. Even uh, the Cerritos coach tried everything in his power to give me a full ride uh, or at least a, a, a bigger uh, scholarship to be able to fund some more stuff. They even wanted to room me and house me with eight other wrestlers. And I was willing to do all that. But at the still at the same token, I still had an apartment. I had no parents. So my counselor even wrote a, a letter to uh, the colleges that I applied for for uh, assist, assistance, grants. And this is, I'm talking two, year 2000, okay? So this is 20 years ago, 23, 23 years ago. Um, she wrote a letter, you know, asking the school districts or the the the, uh, the grants to look at my file closer because I kept getting denied because I couldn't provide tax returns. I couldn't provide my parents' tax returns knowing that I was low income. I couldn't provide where my dad was or where my mom was. Um, my dad was in prison and so I had no communication with him anymore. I get a little into detail on that one. How I lost all connection with my dad because of the crime that he committed. And, um, so I had no reason. So she wrote me this letter. So I, I was making the effort to go to college, mm -hmm. but every door kept getting shut down and I kept that letter and I, I, I screenshotted it and I put it in that album because when I talk about this, I want people to go back and reference like my efforts were there even at a very young age, but that door kept getting shut down. You know, I did a little stint in, in county jail. That wasn't fun. You know, that that woke me up. That was in my early 20s. And until I actually got into uh, real estate, and that was all by a person, just like all my mentors prior, one of the gifts I would say I have is that instead of being envious of a person or, or jealous of a person, um, I'm looking at this person. I was like, how they do it, right? And if they if they did it, I can do it. They're no different than I am. And also, it's like it was one of those things where you mimic the great to be great. You, you, if, you if this guy is telling me that I need to do X, and that's the life I want to a certain degree, maybe I need to start applying what was done. Mm -hmm. You know. So in 2003, uh, my mentor Frank. I didn't know he was a mentor of mine. You know, he, I just met him through a, a mutual friend and uh, we were having dinner and uh, he would, uh, uh, he would always uh, ask how work was. And this, at this point I graduated high school. Okay. I didn't go to college. Uh, I got straight into, there's two options. I was either going to join the military, which I almost did. I did the LA maps. I took the testing. Uh, I did the physical. And then for some reason, uh, something inside me told me this was not for me. Like I, like for some reason I just decided, and I give mad props to all, like we support all aspects. Of oh, I know. You know? Yeah. So yeah. So I'm big on that dude. And so uh, I decided, well, shit, I'll get into construction. You know, I can, I can work, I can work my way up. I started off as a labor, then from there to a journeyman, then to an apprentice. I'm mean, sorry, apprentice, then a journeyman, then I was going to be a foreman. And then the goal was to be a project manager to then become and own my own construction company. Yeah. Fuck it. That's what I'm going to do. Three years into it, I hated it. Hated it with a passion, bro. Yeah. Fucking hated it. And so again, mad props to you. If you do it and you love it, all for it, dude. You know, it, you, we're, we're building... Uh, America, but I was a commercial plumber. So I wasn't a turd chaser. I didn't go on clogged toilets. I literally was looking at a profession in a trade where it was, uh, uh, it was cool because you build it from the ground up literally, yeah. you know, and one of yeah. the statements is like, you know, shit, shit flows downhill. So in other words, you gotta, you gotta grade things. You gotta do it properly. And I, I got into it, but it's to the point where something inside of me was telling me I can do better. I can do more. This is not my calling, but I have at this point bills like I've had mm -hmm. bills since I was the age of 16. Um, I, I don't want to go back to my old ways of slinging dope and doing anything like that, you know, getting caught up in that mess. Um, I, I figured out that no one's going to do it for me. So I got to do it for myself. So just write this thing out. 
keep going forward. And um, during that construction period, I, I realized that, like I said, I wanted to do something better. So then, I, I, you know, my mentor, I remember one time at dinner, I was bitching about my job week. I was like, how much I hated it, how much uh, uh, this wasn't for me. And I was like, it fucking it sucks. The pay is OK, but it's not it's not what I meant to do. And, he, he, you know, after doing this a few times with him, uh, he finally said, he's like, what the fuck are you going to do about it? And I was like, and I'm an alpha male, like true alpha male in, in a very good alpha way, right? In a way that we're like, like you puff her up. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, why, why are you coming at me this way? And then for some reason, something now, told me just now you down. Know. It's like, now you know, right? Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. yeah totally. You're bitching. What totally. are you going to do about it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> about it, right? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you're, you're right. What am I going to do about it? And I was like, look, bro. I was like, I barely, and this guy's already, he was in his uh, late 30s. Okay. So I was, I was only 21 at the time. Okay. 21, 22. Um, uh, I, I was like, you know, dude, I have no college degree. I don't know what else to do. You know, because you're, we are pro- literally programmed as kids from like kindergarten all the way mm-hmm. up to high school. You are programmed. If you don't go to college, you're going to not, you're going to become shit. Right. Yep. And if you got in college, don't take that in the wrong way, but that's the way we're programmed. Institutional education is just not programmed for people to, like us. Go to right? college, get a degree, go get a career, invest in a 401k, yep. Blah, 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 blah. All that BS work, bullshit. Work dude. until you're it, 65 and then maybe you can start living your life. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. I'm like, dude, this is this is what I this is all I knew that the only way to get out was to go to college. And um, he was like, Miguel, it's like you should sell real estate. And he was a real estate broker. So he he was like the guy was legit. Um, and I was like, well, what's, what's real estate? Like building the houses. I do that now. What are you talking about? Like real estate in what aspect? And, and he was like, no, you need to sell real estate. And I was like, well, what is it? And when, as he's explaining to me what real estate is, I'm in my, I've always had this thing as a kid is like, he has two brand new Mercedes outside. His family <laughs> loves them. Beautiful, beautiful house. I was like, all right, where, what do I got to do? Like like that. They're like, all right, where do I sign up? What do I got to do? Yeah. And that's why I have this statement. I have this uh, trademark that I state all the time is, you know, procrastination is death. If you procrastinate right. on a thought, an idea, you're pretty much digging your own grave, right? Yeah. So as he's explaining, I was like, all right, cool. Where do I sign up? Signed up, took all my online requisites, uh, pre- prerequisites, and, and uh, I set up for the state test. But at this time, I'm a 21, 22-year-old punk kid. I'm still partying. I'm still doing my stupid shit that I'm not supposed to be doing. I'm not a hundred percent there because I have this uh, insecurities that I didn't know I had from all the backlash of my family history. Of course, like of course. Lily, me yeah. masking the pain was drugs and alcohol. Me masking, yeah. you know, the pain was wrestling. Me masking everything that I, I had certain things that were positive and negative in my life that were masking certain things. Mm-hmm. Right, so. I was still partying, going heavy, and and I tell this story because I, I like to to tell people that um, you can never quit, okay? Because if you never know what that one opportunity can do and how it can literally change your whole entire life. I mean, whole entire life. I've always been street smart. I've never been book smart in a sense because I, I I'm dyslexic. I have ADHD. Like I'm literally I'm all fucked up in a good way. I think personally, and um. I, I go to do the the testing online and all of it's open books. I'm like, oh, this is fucking a breeze, right? <laughs> and then when I go take my state test, I was still partying the week before. Oh, and man. then I go to take the test and I failed it, you know? And I was like, fuck. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it again. Sign up. I failed my real estate test 11 times, dude. Not because I was... Uh, uh, again, because I, I didn't know how to study or I didn't know how to actually apply what I was learning. I was just, uh, I wasn't committed. Mm-hmm. I was, uh, you weren't all, you weren't all in. You weren't all in. I wasn't all in at all. Yeah. No, I liked the idea of real estate yeah. because of the guy, what he had, but I didn't like what it needed to take until actually one day after I failed at the 11th time, um, 
I, I just got done having the most horrible work week at work. We were in Indio, California. It was 118 degree weather. My uh, foreman, because I was a, an apprentice at this point, a journeyman, going into my foreman uh, foremanship. Like my goal was like his position, mm -hmm. and of course I'm competition to him. So he hated me. Like we were, we would clash, right? So, but he's my foreman, so I have to do what he tells me to do. And that whole work week, I showed up on, on that Monday. I got the test results on Thursday. On that Monday, I show up to work week, and uh, it's freaking uh, – literally, we had to start work week at 4 in the morning. So I had to be up at 2.30 to get to the job site because I lived in Riverside. India was about a two-hour drive, hour-and-a-half drive. And uh, start that 4 in the morning so we can end by noon, 1 o'clock because it was so damn hot. And uh, I remember I show up, and he hands me a shovel. And I was like, what's this? And I was like, I need you to dig this trench. And I was like, well, you got laborers back here, bro. We pay, we pay this. At this point, it was $8 an hour. Yeah. We pay them eight. I'm at 16. I was like, I got to go plumb. And he was like, no, I need you to dig this trench. And I was like, are you serious? I thought he was fucking joking. And he was like, nope. And I was like, all right. Well, fuck. I, I, I was like, in my head, I wanted to quit right there and there. I was like, fuck this guy. I'm out. And, um, but I have bills. So like, you ever, it's amazing when you when you have responsibilities how fast you become an adult right? uh, bro uh, bro because i know what it is to sleep in my car like yeah, shit, yeah. Dude. and i had not even not being looks like i'm eat. looks like i'm digging this look like i'm digging this trench yeah bro so it looks like i'm digging this trench so i started digging the trench and that whole work week bro he he, he did that to me and, the, and and we couldn't use a, a bobcat because it had to be uh, 24 inches by 12 inches deep and it had to go at a grade. So we had to do it okay. by hand. And um, and it was like, fuck me, dude. It's like, why? Why am I fucking doing this? And then I come home that Thursday to uh, fucking, this is before emails in a sense because uh, the, the Department of Real Estate was uh, all letter, yeah. all letterheads. Yeah. And I come home, open my mails. Of course, I'm getting bills. I'm like, fuck. And then I see this, I was like, oh shit. He's like, he's going to tell me if I pass or not. So I get all excited. I open it and I get it out and I was like, fuck. And I just literally lost my shit. I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. Like just going like, what yeah. the fuck? You know? And one thing that I've always done, I've always kept gym in my life. Like training has always been a part of my life. It, it literally keeps me on that gray area when I was still since, fucking since up as a young kid. Since wrestling. Yeah, since wrestling. So, and I still yeah. wrestled even after high school. I would go join some practices just because I loved it so much. Dude. I truly love yeah. that sport. And so I decided to uh, uh, jump in the shower. I was like, I'm cool off and I'm going to go to the gym. I was like, fuck it. I'm done. Right there in that moment, um, I felt defeated and I felt like this is it. I'm, I'm just, I'm just fucked. You know, and, and I got in the shower and as I got out and as I'm getting ready to go to the gym, I was always, I've always, I've been very, uh, hygiene's my thing, OCD dude. Like, so I can be, I, I don't care no matter what. I always went right after work, straight to the, to the house, showered, then to the gym. Cause everybody's like, well, why don't you just go straight to the gym? You're going to shower afterwards anyways. I, that was my method. And I'm thankful for that because that method allowed me to like, let the dust settle and not quit because i looked at myself in the mirror and i remember frank's voice i was like what the fuck are you gonna do about it right there and there it's something like again yeah, snapped and i was like all right i called dj weller who's also one of my franchise owners now as well he's he's one of my good good friends known him for 20 plus years I called him he was, we had a crew right and i called the whole crew and i said yo don't invite me anywhere. Don't tell me there's a party. Don't tell me there's this person, nothing. Like, I don't want to hear from you guys for the next 30 days. It's like, why? It's like, I'm going to study. And then he starts laughing, like, like <laughs> rolling, you know? What do you mean? And I was like, I'm passing this fucking real estate test. I'm passing this fucking do, test, man. <laughs> do, do not bug me. Do not nothing. So I called all of them. And luckily, they all respected me and loved me enough to not do that, not put me in temptation, not even think out of it. It's like, oh, let's see if he wants to go, you know? Like, no one bothered me for 30 days. And since the age of 12, now 22, give or take, mm -hmm. for the first time, I didn't drink. I didn't go out. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I literally studied. I, I went to work. You, I studied. You, you decided to be intentional, super intentional. Yeah. That was 100%. the change, right? Yeah. I'm going to do this weakness. with intention. Yeah. Yep. 
I knew my weakness and I knew that 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 life uh, because every time I wanted to go take the test, it was uh, I put studying off because there was a party I had to go to. I had right. to go to. Right. Uh, I, I'm also hung over for two, three days after. And I'm all the testing was always Monday through Wednesday, every, every, every time you set up. So the time that and then, fuck, it was costly. Dude. It was one hundred dollars every time I failed to take the test it cost me money so i was already 1100 bucks in and that's a lot of money back in the day like a yeah, lot of right. and, and, and you're talking 1100 dollars in and 11 months in so not just the money now looking back i'm like the the time that i just wasted was just like so well, and but it, it had if happened you start, if you start looking at the money you could have made in that 11 months too no bro it could have been a, a game changer but nothing happens by accident but again, they could take it could take one one little thing to have somebody quit, right? And one thing, I'm not a quitter, dude. I don't care what I, I learned that in wrestling. I could, you know, you win some, you lose some, but you never quit. Like if you truly love this or you truly want to do something, you follow through, no matter what. Yeah. And so uh, I didn't quit, you know. And then finally, for the I I I waited the 30 days, took the test, and guess what? I fucking passed, right? And that was such a pivotal point in my life that has created the life that I have today. Because if I didn't do, if I didn't get into real estate at that age, I would have never learned the things that I know about business now. If I didn't get into real estate then, I wouldn't have changed my my surroundings, my my the demographics uh, completely because I went can from I ask, party can I ask guy. Your question? Yeah. You would go back. Would you change anything from 12 to 22 when you passed that real estate exam? Would you change anything in that story? No, I honestly wouldn't. Why? Because it's created. Why? It's created. It's created the man I am today. All the, you, you know, would, it, you wouldn't change all the bad sh- shit either. No, not even because it, it. Why am I such a good father? Because of the shit that I, it just gave me chills, man. It makes me. Uh, that portion is like crucial to me. Like my. Be me being a father, it, it allows me to be the best father because I know what not to do. I think people sometimes discredit the negative things that have, and the traumas and the things that have happened in their life. I think they discredit them to who they can be or who they are or who they could be based off yep. of the negative. Not the positive, but the negative things, the bad shit, the, the things that like, that just, man, that just gut, that gut you. When it happened. Yep. Right. Yep. It's like, oh, this is the yep. worst thing that ever happened to me in my life. And I tell people, and, and I have a ton, I have a ton of those, man. I have, I've, I'm listening mm-hmm. to you and I'm, I'm listening to parallels of my own story. And I, and I look back to every single one of those events, man. And I'm like, that bad thing, that guy making you dig a ditch for a week, you know, you getting hurt. Like all these, all these things that at the moment we feel like, we feel as if the world is ending around us. Yeah. But yeah. it's those moments that that fortify our position and fortify who we are if we so choose it. Yeah, one hundred percent. Those are those those are the pivotal moments in our life. It's not yeah. the good stuff. It, no, it's people the, need to the, recognize the hardship. Yeah, yeah, they need to understand it. It's not nothing. Nothing in this world by accident. Nothing. Yeah. Like if it happens, it's happening for you, not to you. You just need to yeah. let the dust settle and understand that. Like I was yeah. able to shower get out, look in the mirror and then replay that thing. Like what the fuck are you going to do about it? That right there. I was like, Oh shit. What exactly? What am I going to do about it? What do I want for my life? Because I know for a fact, I, you know, one of the major blessings I've had till this day is that I have no parents to call because I don't have an exit. I don't have a, a father that can, you know, Hey, yeah, I'll loan you a hundred grand because you're in, in the hole, you know, or, 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 or give you also the, 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 uh, the ability to, to not figure things out on your own. You know, yeah. if you, and if you have your parents, it's all great too, because that could, that could be, that's obviously a blessing. I like, I want, right. I'm going to be around for my kids forever. Right. But I will never enable my kids either. Because you right. can have parents that enable the shit out of people. And you're seeing it now. You're seeing it in today's society where, you know, kids and even young adults are still enabled by mm-hmm. their surroundings, you know. And that for us, it's like um, I, I see it and I'm like, dude, this is why you failed and you quit. Because you can only fail when you quit. You can't fail when you're failing forward. 
You can't because yeah. you're learning as you're evolving, you're growing, and you're understanding what you can and cannot do, what your capabilities are, where to delegate, where not to delegate. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, aspects. I'm sure you do the same thing. I, you know, I, I see, I see some of the similar, but I'll ask, I'll throw, I'll throw it up, you know, on, on a story or something, but I ask people, Hey, what is the singular thing holding you back? You know what? 90% of it is myself and fear of failure. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's one a thing. lot it's of people, like, man. It, it's, I would say, I would say, why do you think there's only one, 2% of successful people in this world that are truly doing some major things? Think about it. We've learned how to hone that fear and use it as fuel. Like be, being bro. I, I, I always start off stories when I do certain things, uh, uh, promotional things. I was like abandoned, homeless and broke. This is my story. Yeah. Those three things have created the story I have today. You know, because when I got into real estate, my first year in real estate, dude, because um, it was a foreign thing. I didn't know anything about it, but I'm so, once I get a fix. Oh, you're, you're telling me you didn't breakdown. have, you're telling me you weren't a millionaire within your first year? No, what? bro. No, <laughs> not even close, bro. But I did make my first figures my first year. Made $132,000 as a 22-year-old kid. But yet again, didn't know about taxes. <laughs> you know, I was a W-2. And so I, I had a big $40,000 tax bill at the end, didn't save it. Then I learned how to incorporate. So real yeah. estate, that license and that, that what I say pivotal, I mean, it's taught me everything I know. But then also every job there prior uh, has taught me how to leverage the things, the skill sets that I developed into yeah. real estate. Now, real estate into franchising, because some of you guys out there might be going through uh, a, a job right now or a career choice that you just hate and dread, right? But look at the good things that can come out of that. What are the skill sets mm -hmm. that you can learn that you can evolve? Like my first job was uh, selling women's clothing at Contempo at the Tyler Mall in Riverside. Fucking 16 years old. I got the job. I was like making ends meet to, to, to do what I can, right? Um, yeah. I'm a, I'm a young kid. I was in the fear of selling clothes to women. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you know, but I look back. I was like, that taught me the skill sets now in real estate. If I can sell that to women, I can sell anything to anybody. And then you yeah, know man. how they operate, how they think, how, you know, how to get that emotional connection, get them to buy it. Cool. And then I made my commissions, you know, then getting into, uh, then I got a second job in the same mall working at sunglass hut selling, you know, uh, sunglasses. I knew that the Maui gyms would give me a 3% commissions versus the Arnett would give me a 1% commission. So fuck, what did I learn? I learned everything about those damn Maui gyms, the polarized lens, where you can look, how to look at things. And I was like, cool. That taught me some parts of sales commissions. And I, and I didn't even know these are the things that were teaching me for real estate. Right. I worked at a third job I had, uh, with my graveyard was, uh, uh, castle park. Castle park was an amusement park. They put me in the kitty rides. The kitty rides were all the kids taught me patience, how to be mm -hmm. patient, customer service. So the graveyard job, you know, taught me everything I need to know about warehouse distribution, how that runs and operates. Working at uh, homegrocer.com, they used to, so basically it was one of the first warehouses that would uh, um, package people's groceries at night to get delivered the next morning online when that was like the boom. So taught me all about distribution how the how that works now that helps me with my apparel company that we distribute and sell to in fulfillment so all these skill sets that you people are developing through the jobs that they hate right now leverage that then hone that in and say okay what am i going to do about it how am i going to change my current position what i'm doing and how can i make it better and what i really want to do right um and, and, it, and if you can figure that out man you'll be super successful in all aspects of life that's right. So, so, so how long did you, how long did you do real estate? I'm still a real estate broker. I've been real estate for, uh, since 2003. Uh, I made my okay. first, so the way, so let's fast forward a little bit, but so, um, got my real estate license, made my first figures, uh, six figures as a real estate agent. Uh, from there by 2007, I owned my own brokerage. I owned uh, realty world and associates. I had a, a, a phenomenal book of business. I was increasing my revenue every year. By 2009, I made my first million in real estate, net 1 million, like commissions, 100. I sold in 2009 was the recession too, by the way. When everybody was getting out of the market, I literally honed in and just 
sold like crazy. All the people that couldn't qualify from 2003 to 2009, now we're able to qualify. And I stayed in contact. That's the other thing I believe in relationships. Even though they got denied, I was like, oh, most agents, 99% of the agents would like Done. throw them out, like peace out, never yep. talk to them. I leveraged Facebook and stayed in contact with them. I would say happy birthday to their kids when they posted about their kids. I'd make sure that was like my constant contact because I remember we used to pay a service of $1,500 a month. And this was in 2005, six, which is a lot of money for a service back in the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, but to send out emailers, cooking recipes, like all the fucking junk. Right. And we're paying this because they're like, oh, that's the thing to do. And yeah. I figured out when Facebook rolled out, I was like, I'll follow my client. They'll follow me back. Oh, boom, constant contact in a free format. So then yep. I made it cool. And then I also changed the game in real estate when in, in my demographic area. I always would, uh, you know, I've read some pretty good books that changed my life. One was Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, The Purple yep. Cow and Think and Grow Rich, right? But The Purple Cow really gave me a different perspective of how to become different from everybody else. So I started uh, doing video t uh, tutorials of these homes, but instead of playing the normal classical music that was boring as fuck and no one gave, I would put some hip hop in there, put some Zap Rogers, some <laughs> funk. And they're like, and th that engagement like skyrocketed, right? So I was able to sell a lot of homes in 2009. And then again- Can I stop you real quick? So yeah, yeah. I, I want to I want to highlight something because we we talk about this a lot. And if you look at the Great Depression, uh, there was a lot of new millionaires that came out of the Great Depression. All right. Yeah. We look at the 2008 thing. We look at, you know, it's happened over and over and over recessions and things of like that. You know, even now, right, where everybody, you know, we've been talking a lot about money on the podcast the past few weeks. And um, it comes down to a choice. Like, yeah. yes, these things are, could be happening at some level, whatever. So you can go, Oh, we're in a recession. So we're going to make less money or, yeah. you know, foo fit happened and we're going to, everything's on a decline, you know, or we can yeah. go, I don't care. I'm going to do us. I'm going to go make a bunch of money and I'm going to go sell and I'm going to go build my business. And regardless of what's going on in the, in, in the environment. And it's yep. and like, I hear people that I know people that lost a ton of money that time. Yeah. But I also know people that made the decision to go, um, I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing anyway. Same thing with, when, when yeah. the whole I, pandemic happened, you know, we had our biggest no, year. Everybody no. was like, everybody was like, Oh, it's done. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody businesses are crashing. Bro, I had the biggest year ever I had. Now don't get me wrong. I had some trials and tribulations. We'll, we'll get to, I want to ask you about, and you know, we'll get to it at the end. But um, at the end of the day, that year was pivotal in my life. Yeah. So it's about, yeah. you made it, you made, it's funny that you, the successful people make choices, man. They make fucking yeah. choices to win regardless. And I tell all the time, like, you can't fucking beat me because I choose yeah. to win period. Yeah. Period. There's no quit in us. You know, we're, we're a different breed for sure, but everybody has that capability if they can hone in into that mindset to understand yeah. that you have a choice. You can choose a or B, you know, A is going to be super difficult. There's going to be a lot of challenges or there's B where you're just going to live a mediocre life. You're always going to be struggling, living paycheck to paycheck because you, that's what you chose. I chose to change that for myself. I chose to change for myself and no one else because if I change that within myself, then it affects everybody around me in a positive yeah. light, you know, yeah. and having that ability to understand especially during 2000, look at the recession was no joke in 2007 to 2010 is when it kind of yeah. started climbing back up. I saw a lot of people, do, uh, you know, I had some, some broker friends that committed suicide, you know, because they were living the high life and then lost it all. Um, yeah. Just same as this pandemic, you know, like you, yeah. you get, we'll get into that in a little bit, but yeah, it's, um, it, it was crazy to see. And I just remembered that, my mentor, again, you mimic the great to be great. One thing that he instilled in me was like, there's always going to buy, be a buyer. There's always going to be a seller. You just got to go out and find them. That's it. Yeah. There's not, everybody's going to suffer. Not everybody's going to have lost everything. There's going to be people looking for opportunities. And you're going to be able to assist them. And that's what I did, you know, and uh, it did me very, very well, but it you focused, you focused me. on what you could do, not all the things that you couldn't do. 
no dude and then you get creative yeah. like get super creative yeah. like if if, if 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 you know door knocking was your thing and it wasn't working then don't door knock and go something else yeah. go meet people at the gym go meet people like one thing that i have is like i love to be social i love to make re- friends and relationships you know my very first two deals came out of la fitness again the gym has always been my home my very first two deals was i was still working construction okay i got licensed i still worked in construction but instead of, I would never walk into the gym in construction clothes, so no one knew what I did for work, right? And I yeah. would go to the gym, and I was always that kid where I would always get asked by older gentlemen uh, or people in the gym, uh, like, how do you stay so lean? How are you so strong? I, you know, because they want advice of, uh, of a healthy lifestyle. And uh, in all those, obviously, a walking billboard for myself in that aspect. So yeah. anytime someone would ask me about, let's say, nutrition, and this was already programmed in my head. And I knew that the office setting and door knocking wasn't my thing. It just was never my thing. I want to go meet people to get these relationships going. Yeah. So the gym was my thing. I figured that out real quick. So the gym, I would show up and when people would ask, I was like, so how, man, how are you staying so lean? I was like, how are you so shredded? I was like, yo, bro. It's like, you know, my job, my career allows me to manage my food intake, to eat when I need to eat and prep all my food. What do you do? Oh, I sell real estate. They're like, huh? Yeah, I sell real estate. I was like, oh, cool. And that would happen, right? And it would happen a lot. And I just plant the seed. I wouldn't even, oh, here's a card. Use me if you want to, you know, buy or sell. No, You're just, just making friends. Seeds. Just making friends, yeah. buying seeds. Now the next question would be, I was like, oh, now how are you so strong? But hey, how's the real estate market? Is it a good time to buy? Is it good this? I've already built a relationship with them directly on that aspect, right? So now if I, it, it, I was be like, and I'd be brutally honest with them. The market's X or the market's doing this. If I didn't know the answer, I didn't tell them, hey, I don't know the answer. I was like, hey, yo, look at the market's ever changing, which it is. I said, let me let me dig into this uh, a little bit further and I'll get back to you in the next 24 hours. And I'd get their number and I'd go straight to my broker at that time. Like, yo, this question is like, what do I do? And then he wouldn't do the job for me. He wouldn't tell me the answer. I need you to go look this up and I need you to go pull this book. All right, cool, cool, boom. Yo, bro, I got, all right, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. And they would be like, all right, cool. And that's how I got my two deals, dude. And those two deals... I, I closed them in 45 days or less. And when I got the commission checks, right, I was so engaged and so like excited of just getting the job done right and not losing yeah, these, yeah. these guys that I didn't even remember what I was going to get paid until I got paid. And I opened up the checks and my broker was like, you should be really proud of yourself. I was like, oh, thank you. You know, I didn't, I didn't know what he meant at the time, but I knew now when I opened my check and I look, I was like fucking $62,000 in commissions, bro. I was like, fuck, you know, and this is, I've never made this much money at one time unless it was me. You're like, is this you know, real? Like, can I, can I put real? this in the bank? <laughs> oh, wait, wait till you hear this, bro. So I get it. I was like so excited, right? I was like, shit. And I was still working as a, as a plumber. So I was still doing both jobs. I would, I, and I had a piece of shit car. I had to go rent a car in the weekends to go show property in because I didn't have nothing nice to, to tow yeah. people around. And so I'd made everything work. Um, Went to Wells Fargo, I remember, and, and the teller knew me there because I would always deposit my my real estate, my uh, plumbing checks. And I went and take her the check, and she goes, I was like, all right. Then, you know, they stamp it. They stamp the back. And then she was like, Prince, I was like, all right, there's going to be a 10-day hold on this. I was like, huh? What? I was like, no, it, they're real. It's real money. And I was like, I swear. And I was like, it's like, it's not stolen is what I said. And she was like, because I thought a hold, they're going to hold it because yeah. they find it's a fucking illegal check, right? Yeah. And uh, they're looking at like, you, no. they're like, nah, yeah. bro, no. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, no, nah, Miguel, there's a 10 day hold because you never had this amount of money in your bank. And they needed to clear yeah. first before they get right. deposited. I was like, oh, right. fuck. I was like, all right, shit. <laughs> that was, and that was a blessing in itself, dude, because now looking back, it was like those 10 days, I was already, you know, I was like, I was like, I'm going to go buy this. I'm going to go buy that, you know? And I decided that in those 10 days to not have a crutch, I decided to go. And uh, I, I remember I woke up and uh, I was reading uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I was looking at like, I was freaking out. I was like, if this doesn't work, at least I can do this. I can do that. I always have plumbing. And, and I remember my mentor told me, he was like, if you're going to go all in, you go all in. You don't, you yeah. don't do part-time real estate. There's no such thing as part-time real estate. Yeah. And I was, I was like, especially if you want to be successful. So I was like, all right. So I woke up, I was supposed to be at the job site at six o'clock that morning. I woke up at four and I called my foreman 
I didn't even, I, I just got up. I, I, I remember I got up off the bed. I, I go to my, my cell phone. I call my foreman and tell him, hey, dude, I'm not coming in today. And I was like, well, what's wrong? You sick? And I was like, nah, uh, I quit. And he was like, huh? I was like, yeah, I quit. And I was like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not fucking doing this anymore. I'm going to concentrate on real estate. And he starts laughing at me. I was like, "Hey, you better yeah. put in your two. Yeah. He's like, you better you, you better put in your two weeks because you're gonna want this job back." Uh, and I was like, "Nah, I fucking quit." And he and he kept <laughs> laughing. I was like, "And hey, why don't you go fuck yourself?" Boom, hung up. <laughs> you know. And um, then again, another moment where I started panicking, dude, almost in tears yeah, again, course. like panicking. Course, I was yeah. like, "What the fuck did I just do? I just fucked my you whole just, life." You, I was like, "Oh just, shit!" You just jumped in with the sharks, homie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so, so automatically, my defense mechanism kicks in. I was like, "Well, at least I can do, uh, I can do side jobs. I can do this. I can do that. I can market it. But if, if this doesn't work out, at least I can pick up some side jobs to help." Yeah. Because I, because as a plumber, yeah. as a commercial plumber, especially, you you acquire uh, certain tools that only plumbers use. So I had my whole tool bucket, had my my tools. I, I basically I had enough to be able to do side jobs if needed. And and again, something inside me was like, "Why are you giving yourself a crutch?" I was like, "You're all in or you're all out. Which one is it? Have one foot in, one foot out. Which one is it, Miguel?" Talking to myself like a like a crazy man. And I was like, Saturday, I had a yard sale. Like, sold every tool, everything, dude. I mean, every the only thing I kept, and it's on my Facebook as a as a uh, as one of the the albums as well. I kept my Milwaukee drill, my Milwaukee drill. I bought it for a hundred and twenty a hundred twenty dollars was such a huge sacrifice because this was during my apprentice program, and I wasn't making sixteen bucks an hour. I was making literally like ten dollars an hour at that point. Yeah. I was slightly above a labor, and. I sacrificed a lot to buy that, that tool. I needed it. And the, the company doesn't provide you that one tool. They'll provide you some other stuff, but they won't provide you that tool. Like you needed your own drill. And I remember yeah. I went to Home, De- Home Depot, bought my drill, and I kept that drill. That's the only thing I didn't sell because I, I love art. I'm a very – I'm fully covered. I have art all throughout our house. Like, um, yeah, I was like, I want to be able to hang my own art in my house when I go buy it. So I kept that drill, but I sold everything else, dude. And then, ever since then, never looked back. I haven't done, I, I won't, I, until this day, and I know how to fix a fucking leaky sink. I won't do it. I told myself yeah. I'll never touch plumbing again. And that's just me, my own thing. Not that I'm too good for it. It's just, again, why go backwards, right? So now fast forward to 2012, um, the most humbling thing could ever happen to me, right? Yeah, you take this young kid. I'm a functioning drug addict alcoholic. Uh, I was still partying, doing blow, doing drinking, like all kinds of stupid shit okay i was uh, a successful real estate uh brokerage uh i was married I, at this point got married two beautiful daughters at home and then they uh you know i i was living the life and then i was running my company with a lot of pride and ego and by 2012 i went bankrupt i overextended myself i shot myself in the Damn. foot i led a, i led a company with a lot of pride i like more like look at me, look at me type deal, right? Had to file bankruptcy, uh, humbling as fuck, dude, lost it all, right? Was able to keep a couple of things, lost some rental investment properties because I didn't hire the right attorney. You know, I had an LLC that had my rental properties. And I remember even just hiring, this is how prideful I was, okay? I went and told, um, I hired a bankruptcy uh, attorney through Google and decided that, uh, I was not going to go into his office. So I, I hired him. I said, okay, cool. I'll pay you, but uh, I'm not coming into his office. Can we go into, uh, uh, can you meet me at Starbucks? And he did. Cut him a check, meet him at Starbucks. They kept some of my rental properties during the bankruptcy. So I lost it all again. You know, I lost it, bought him. And instead of playing the victim, I decided, hey, okay, what do I got to do? What, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. I was still a very successful real estate agent myself, but I ran a company to the ground. Uh, then that's where I created self-made fitness, you know, started with uh, a garage gym to make ends meet. Uh, and then we outgrew that within a year after bankruptcy had about $75,000 back in the account or back on our feet, getting things, you know, shaking and moving. And then outgrew that. So decided to get all my classic cars back into the garage, decided that. Let me pause pause right right there. I'm going to use the bathroom. So I, I was gonna say I am part of that B I'm part of that BK club as well. Yay, bro. Yeah, it, 2000, it, it, 2015 it hit me. It hit you fifteen, huh? 
And yeah. it's crazy how, how that can make us even that much stronger, wiser, and uh, truly understand. Like, homeless was, was rough. Like, homeless yeah. was like... But the, 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 the thing with being homeless and, and not being able to eat, it, it's like, and, and you're, 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 you, you would understand. So like, it was about me. Like I can mm-hmm. fend for myself. I can do this. Now, bankruptcy was a different hit, bro. Like I was yeah. married. I had two kids. Like I have two kids. Uh, it's, it was a different hit. I was like, how in the fuck did I let this happen? But again, honing in understanding let the dust settle i Mm -hmm. fucked up it's my fault so i'm gonna fix it for every problem there's a solution you know i learned that in wrestling my wrestling coach told me he would hate he would hate i mean with a passion i mean hate okay if we ever said out loud that we were stuck in a move he would literally lose a gasket i've never seen this man get so red and literally like i mean he's gonna (laughs) fucking have heart attack or stroke right now right so we would stay away yeah. from using that word. But sometimes when they're drilling and you do get stuck and you're like, I'm stuck, it just comes out. So I did yeah, that yeah. one time in my wrestling career, you know, one time. And I he broke us up. You're not fucking stuck. Like literally, it, it embarrassed the shit out of me. This is the move. I, uh, get to it. And then we start, we keep flowing. And at this point, I, I'm, uh, I think I was uh, 17 at the time. It was my junior year in high school. And I remember I was like, you know, this is like a father figure. So if he's yelling at you like that, you, you take it and you're like almost like in tears. And they're like, but you still keep wrestling. And then after practice, he pulls me to the side and he tells me, you know why I did that, right? He's like, I know, coach. You never want to see you stuck. There's a for every move. There's a counter move. I know, coach. I know, coach. Like I, my head down, like tail in between <laughs> my legs. Like I, 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 I fucked up, coach, you know? Yeah. And he was like, he was like, no, Miguel. I'm going to tell you what this is, okay? Not only will this help you be an, a, an elite wrestler because that's the mindset you're going to have, but I want you to apply this to life. I was like, what do you mean? It's like in life, it's just like wrestling. You're always going to have moves and counter moves. In life, you're always going to have problems and you're going to have to create solutions. So yeah. those solutions, whether you like them or not, there's a solution to that problem. So just no one's ever, No one's ever really stuck. They say it, they think it, they feel it, but they're not stuck. No, you're not stuck, dude. So yeah. 2012 went bankrupt, but it created this blessing and it created this company that now instead of a, a prideful company with my real estate, don't get me wrong. I still love real estate. I flip a lot of homes. I still actively do real estate. I'm actually going to be featured on HGTV, Flipping 101 with Tarek. And then uh, possibly they're going to use that as a pilot for our own show. So a lot of things awesome, have, have positive yeah, for, for real estate. Yeah. But creating that garage gym was just to make ends meet. Right, but I've always loved health and fitness. Health and fitness has improved my life and has saved my life multiple times throughout my life. It's it's been that constant that constant positive. No matter what you're self sabotaging or doing, that's always been the the foundation. Yeah, one hundred percent, dude. And uh, and I love it, and I love it so much that I I would do it for free. I was, you know, I was doing (laughs) it, you know, for myself and others. And we all grew it. Went to a uh, I'll grew the garage after a year. You know, I, I basically, and then if you guys, uh, once you guys follow me, you'll see how OCD I am in a good way. Not like one of those anal dudes. No, but, it's beautiful, dude. If any, <laughs> if, if, if I was ever going to have, listen, I did the gym thing, but if I was ever going to have another gym, bro, your gyms, that's, Thank it's you, like bro. where my head's at. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. A lot of, pride it's, it's, goes into it's that. even, it's of- even my, it's even my branding. It's like, I'm like. Those are my colors. That's my lighting. That's <laughs> uh, so dope, dude. You yeah. Know, and that's the thing. I even did that in the garage gym. If you go to my Facebook page, you see the uh, in 2012 when we did the 2012-13 uh, when we did the garage gym, it used to have just concrete floors and white walls. You know, yeah. and I was like, no, I'm if I'm nah. gonna sell personal training, nope. I epoxied the floors, did everything, did surround sound, spent about 10 grand in that day. Luckily, I found on Craigslist a full gym setup that was all white and black. So it was like, dude, you'd walk into my garage and you thought you were walking into a commercial gym. You would never know that was a garage. You know, I drywalled all the walls. Like, it looked the part. And, um, but we outgrew that. And so then decided to to take the the personal training to a cardio cardio, uh, kickboxing studio 
that did mm-hmm. MMA class and other stuff. And they had some, some tools there, but not much, but like he would let us use the space. It's a much bigger space. We can bring in more people. So like, cool. Got into that. And literally not even 60 days later, they closed the doors. They locked everything up. All our stuff's in there. The, the owner uh, of the gym was not paying the landlord. So we're mm. like stuck. Again, back against the wall. I already have a book of clientele. Like the clientele is already there. We got to take them somewhere. So yeah. I um, I decided to call up the big box gyms. You know, I won't mention which ones because I never want to belittle them. Like I love gyms. Like if you go to a gym and you know what to do, cool, go to a gym. But if you're looking for personal training, this is why I created what I created. So started interviewing with these people, right? I started interviewing and um, – Come to find out, I was like, I'm charging 75 bucks an hour at that time. You know, so I was a, a lead trainer getting people to do what they needed to do. And uh, we find out that, yeah, they'll provide you everything, but they'll pay you minimum wage to maybe 25 bucks an hour. But they're now charging 100 to $150 a session. So I was like, so you're telling me I'm doing all this and I'm getting these guys motivated and encouraged and inspired to change their life in a positive way. And you're going to keep 80 to 85% of my revenue. And they're like, yeah. I was like, all right, peace out. I'm out. <laughs> so I was like, oh, maybe at first I was like, oh, maybe it's just this gym. And then dude, I interviewed six of them, the six big box gyms within my community and all of them exactly the same. Same so model. Like, well, yeah. Same model. So I was like, fuck this. I was like, well, I know there's boutiques. There's small little places that have like some stuff like the cardio kickboxing place. Let's see if they have some room for us. Well, I would go to them. And almost same concept in a lower scale. They still wanted a punch card for all the members. They wanted me to carry their name, not my name. Um, yeah. They wanted uh, me to build up their clientele, not our clientele. So I was like, how is this even possible? So I, right there, another light bulb hit. Like another, I was like, for every problem, there's a solution, Miguel. If you can create the solutions to this world, you become a millionaire, I was told, right? Yeah. So I was like, how many trainers just like me, like us, like are looking for a space, but want to truly, you know, build their space, but don't have the capital to build the gym because it's, it's not cheap. No. And so I started, I started dissecting everything, dude. I literally had my pros and cons. And I wrote everything about what could be positive of this and what could be negative. And right there, it hit me. I was like, I don't want to build a gym. I want to build an institution of education of entrepreneurship. I want trainers to be entrepreneurs in their space. I want them to develop careers versus working for somebody. And that's where mm-hmm. self-made training facilities started. You know, started with a, so I ended up finding a, a commercial gym, a commercial warehouse, a light industrial space. It was 3,900 square feet in Marietta. Uh, got denied the first time. And this is again, not quitting because I just got out of bankruptcy. So everything else looked good on paper besides my bankruptcy. And I, me personally, wasn't even thinking like, I'm going to get denied. I was like, oh, dude, I got 75 K in the bank. I got this, I got that. I'm good. Got denied. But instead of taking no for the answer, I contacted the owner. I bypassed yeah. the broker and said, Hey, yeah. Contact them and say, hey, look, I have a great opportunity to do some amazing things. I have a very unique concept that no one's doing it to the capability that I'm going to do it at. I just need an opportunity. What will it take for you, for us to earn your trust to lease this place out? And I was like, look, I'll show you my credit report prior to my bankruptcy. I'll show you what I did prior to my bankruptcy. I'm a good dude. I, I just fucked up. I overextended myself. Yeah. It was like, send it over. Calls me the next day and said, all right, Miguel, this is the only way I'm going to do it. I need first and last month's up front, and I need first uh, double security deposit. I was like, dude, I got 75K. I built my gym in the garage for about 10. I was like, all right, done. Signed the paperwork, gave him $25,000, got me my, my lease. Get Scored, to work. Right? Get to work. Get to work. <laughs> yeah. Well, commercial versus garage, completely different fucking concept, bro. Yeah. By the time I figured out my rubber flooring, right? I put rubber flooring, black paint, my mirrors, uh, and uh, uh, a Dude, dumbbell set is all I got. Okay? This shit is expensive, bro. If you don't know, if you haven't been in the gym business, it is when you walk into a gym, there's a lot of money in that gym, regardless of what kind yep. of gym it is. Yep. And that's the thing, dude. I ran out of money. And I'm yep. like, fuck, no equipment, no, literally ran out of money. And it's not like you and can I, borrow money. 
Nope. I didn't have nobody to call. Didn't, I wasn't, and none of it was finance. Like I, I took no loans because yeah. I didn't qualify. I just got out of bankruptcy. So no hard money, no nothing, like no funding. I ran out of, I was down to like a hundred and something bucks. And I was like, what the fuck just happened? How did I not strategically plan for this? And I was like, uh, thing came up in my head. Uh, I tell myself this one and you make some fucked up decisions sometimes. I was like, don't, don't ever, don't love something that doesn't love you back. Yeah. So in other words, any material items that I had, if I can sell them, sell them. So I had a beautiful 1970 Suburban, original three-door delivery, slammed Oof. to the ground, custom, sound system, beautiful fucking, like rare as fuck, dope as fuck. <laughs> Sold that. Sold my 2012 Road King that was all choloed out. v It was featured in Hot Bikes magazines with my lowrider, my 59. And uh, those two finished the gym, dude. And if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have the life that I have today. Another pivotal point, right? Yeah. And yeah. now, uh, fast forward, we started this um, this career, this, this, this path that I chose is like true success is when you can bring others with you, right? And that's what I've done for the last eight years. I've literally brought on over 2,000 personal trainers as independent contractors. I have uh, 21 open operating franchises. I have uh, 36 sold. I have another 10 on the books. Uh, even during the pandemic, uh, it, it made us even greater than where we already are. You know, like it, we pivoted, we created exclusivities inside of our facilities to allow us in one stay open and fight the system. Uh, like hundred percent, like we're facing 10 well, years that's in prison, how, half a million that's dollar how, fines. That's how I found you was Jeff Matterdy. How, how you say his last name? Yeah. Uh, Jeff, uh, uh, I'm happy. Yep. Yeah. And, um, cause the same thing is he, a, is, does he have a, he has one of your facilities, correct? correct yeah and they and they yeah, shut so they shut we have they, and they, they shut, shut me down the location down yeah they shut you down they shut yeah. like they shut they try to shut all of us down and then we fought them dude and literally they dismissed the case the day of um because of, of lack of evidence and lack of like they didn't want to go public with this dude if well we not just that there's down. there's no law <laughs> no goes to no court law, there's, no, there's no but law i, I mean that's a beautiful thought, a part of uh, being a free thinker and then being the why guy. If I can advise anybody to do anything, be the why guy. Ask why. Like even like like anything that we tell you as entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, like ask why. Like why? Why would we want to do this and then research it, dissect it and say, okay, cool. This is what I'm going to do or no, this is not for me. And that was, uh, you know, one of the things that my mom, I remember when I was young because I would always be like, why? Why I got to do that? Why I got to do that? It's like you should have been in a, an attorney or a lawyer, you know, because you're gonna you're gonna fight me to the tooth and nail of, of getting this thing done, and that's what I did. I fought. We fought to stay open. We stayed open. We sold seven franchises during that time. Um, we also uh, acquired some locations that closed and converted them into self made. Like we literally saw an opportunity when everybody was willing to quit because that's what they did. They quit. So I have no sympathy for that aspect right? because you all had a choice, you know. Yeah. Um, but we chose not to well, quit and we chose. Well, that's the difference in when everybody, and we just said this in the last podcast, when everybody is being fearful, pay attention, yeah. pay attention yeah. and then probably you do the opposite. And pay attention. Yeah. Do opposite. Exactly. Yeah. Like I don't watch even to this day. I don't, I, I, I observe and I pay attention, but I don't, I don't watch the media. You know, I'm not, I don't, I don't get sucked into that aspect. I watch enough to know what's going on to then, research and do my own uh analogy yeah. of what needs to happen um but I, I i look at i i go back to this like we as people right have the ability to do amazing things and and we just have to basically pass that hurdle of fear and doubt right because doubt is fear that's all that's all that is and really understand what what if it does real, go really well for you. Like yeah. my, 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 my thing, I was like, I had no other option in, in should I do real estate or should I do construction? Well, what if I do do good? Cool. Versus looking at it as well. Again, I was, I was literally laughed at just like with self-made. I was, when I opened up my first location, everybody, who's going to pay you to go to the gym? Who's going to do that? Who's, who's going to want to build your name? Who's like, it's not my name. The name's not Miguel Aguilar's compound. And at this point I was already an IFBB pro. 
I was an elite mm-hmm. power lifter, got my elite numbers in my second meet. So I had a name and, and recognized in the industry. Um, but again, Pride and Eagle was like the crush of my last company. I wasn't going to let that happen again. And at the same token, I stopped chasing money, you know, because in real estate, I was chasing money because I, that's all I knew because I had no money prior. So mm-hmm. I've had a taste of success and then I lost it all. So now I'm chasing the process. Like I'm bringing people with us. Like truly, I, I literally have the ability to help these trainers develop the skill sets that they need to be successful in this space. And no matter whether they're making $150,000 with us a year or 50000 that investment with us does not change. Versus so- corporate gyms, they're going to boost you, post you up and, and do everything because they're getting a commission off of that. Yeah, of course. So can I ask you, where did the name, because you're a team guy, yeah. you're a family guy. So where did the name self-made come from? Because it's not really, so, it is self-made, but, but you, you say we a lot, you say team, yeah. you say family, my people. Yeah. So, so yeah. can you, can you wrap that around for me? I, I, I wanted to change the stereotype to that name because I, so my, my apparel company is self-made family. Right. Okay. SFMD family. And then when we say where champions are self-made, it's our that's our one of our slogans for the self-made training facility. Now, self-made has always been a thing for me of understanding like a true self-made individual takes action behind the thoughts and the ideas. But it's a family. Right. Whether it be blood or whether it be coworkers or whatever it may be, that truly defines the success of a self-made man. So. It's almost like contradicting each other. It's almost like an oxymoron because it's a very singular word with a very uh, with family being a very unified word, right? With, with, so I wanted to change that. And it was always great because people was like, well, you're not self-made. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I'm not truly self-made. I have a family that created the self-made man. You've got co- coaches and mentors and all these people that all you can, uh, yeah. And, and I don't, and again, the beautiful thing about uh, wrestling has always taught me that, look, it's a very individual sport. Like it really is, you know, even though yeah. you're there with the team, it's an individual sport. It's on you. It's on you. Yeah. It's on you 100% because like when you go on that mat, dude, even in jujitsu now, we go on that mat, it's you against the opponent. Now yeah. you win. Great. You share the success with your team, your professor, your coach, whatever you, that's right. shared. Because all the weeks prior and months prior to get to this competition, iron sharpens iron. They helped yeah. me get to this position. Now, if you lose, right, my fault. I didn't train hard enough. Or I didn't. I wasn't strategic. Or I let my emotions. Ninety percent of the times, yeah, it's, it's not. The, match, it's not their emotions, fault. Yeah, it's no, not their fault. No, it's yeah. not their fault. So you take that on. So that's why. This is the self-made family. Like we take, like I share the success. Like I wouldn't be where I'm at today without my team members. You know, yeah. my team members and my staff at, at, at corporate, I'm able to do this kind of stuff. And I'm able to continue to share and be the visionary to the brand and the company that we're trying to, you know, not trying, that we are propelling. Like we're a national company. We're in seven different states. You know, we're going to be international here within the next 24 months. That's that we're already working on deals for that. We are not stopping anytime soon. And it's all based on success of others. So for us, it's always going to stay that way, even till this day. And don't get me wrong. Look, membership gyms are great, right? But they devalue the, the craft of personal training. Because if you charge a membership, you're really taken away from the trainer. Because if you're there really focused as an independent contractor, there should be no membership. Till this day, eight years later, I've yet to charge one membership to use our facilities. You can only use our facilities if you hire our trainers. And our trainers are independent contractors. They have their own pricing and they have their own schedule. They are truly independent contractors. So that alone has protected the value of these trainers because we, we look at them as the value. The equipment, don't get me wrong. I love the equipment. It's super expensive equipment, as you know. Um, yep. I actually own the equipment company, so I get it. And guess what? It has no value to me it's just metal Mm -hmm. because when you're changing and improving somebody's life through personal training or coaching those two things you can't put a you can't put a a value to it you really can't think about it a personal trainer for me in my vision right the way i look at a personal trainer because the ones that have been in my life have done this for me you're either saving somebody's life right because Mm -hmm. if they're whether they're battling mental health depression suicide uh health in a sense of obese diabetes whatever it may be right 
if you if that individual hired one of our coaches and that coach inspired them to change their habits and their well-being like literally this is a human being changing another human being's life how in the hell is that how can you even put a price on that how can you how can you say i'm going to give you minimum wage for this right you can't and that's what i wanted to change from day one and i have because now look at you've saved another human's life directly and indirectly and or like a kid myself want to improve their life you know let's say you have a high school kid that wants to play varsity ball needs to put on 10 pounds they're going to hire a coach they're going to hire a strength coach and that strength coach has developed this young man to now play varsity. Now he became a stud in varsity. And now he's going to college. And then from college, now he might be playing pro ball. And it all started with a coach that inspired the kid to believe in himself to be able to do what he needs to do. So you're improving their life. Or again, 41 years old, doing jujitsu, putting, you know, getting fucking wrapped up like a pretzel. My professor is constantly saving my life. This sport, jiu-jitsu, has taught me so much about myself. It brings me back to wrestling, for one, and, but even, even greater than wrestling. Because talk about controlling your emotions. Talk mm-hmm. about controlling your environment in a very tough situation. And you apply those principles to business? Oh, fuck, dude. You're unstoppable. The things, and you said it already, you said it in conjunction with rest, wrestling. You know, we talk a lot about jiu-jitsu on this podcast. Um, for obvious reasons, most successful people, for some reason, are just doing yeah. jiu- jiu-jitsu. <laughs> yeah, jiu-jitsu, yeah, because right. because the things that you learn there, the things that you learn on the mats, one hundred percent, just like you said early in the in, in the in the uh, in the talk, um, transfer to life lessons. Yeah, it really yeah. they really do. It's amazing. It's an amazing sport. It's an amazing martial art because the things that you learn, the tenacity th- that you learn. The problem solving that you learn, the stress, the, the the ways to manage stress, all of that transfers into your life, and it does bleed 100% over. One hundred percent, yeah, it does. Yeah. It bleeds over, and it's it's. Uh, and again, I think more people need to be involved in these type of sports, and more men, especially, especially yeah. women too, for self defense, like all kinds of stuff. Because right, it's 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 a. Um, it's putting it's yourself also. Sport. It's main like I didn't start. I didn't start until I was like thirty seven years old. Um. But it's because I, I had done a bunch of things, you know. I've I've done a lot of things in my career, right, and uh, in my life, a uh, bunch of hard things. But I still needed, even though I was getting older, even though I'm 40 years old now, like I still need to do these hard things. I need to put. I mean, let's. I, I talked about it earlier. I was like, listen, I have a soft life. I have a really nice house. Yeah. I have a really expensive bed. You know what I mean? It's a Tempur-Pedic yeah. mattress. Yeah. I sleep at a no cool joke. six. I, I sleep at a cool, I have a, I have a Uller on my thing. So I sleep at a 64 degrees. You know what I mean? I have a nice car. I sit in nice chairs. Like I have a soft yeah. fucking life. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I have to go, I have to go create hardship for me because yeah. growth happens on the yeah. fringe. You know what I mean? And then I look yeah. at, I, and I start, you know, you know, surrounding myself with like-minded individuals. What are they all doing? Same thing. Yeah. Pushing, pushing to the fringe. Cause that's where growth yeah. happens. That yes, they have a they have a soft life as well, but we fabricate. Yeah. We go out and search hardship so that we can learn yeah. and grow and fail and fail because you're gonna fail. Yeah. yeah. And when you, yeah. we know once you get there, you realize if I fail, I'm gonna learn. If I fail, I'm gonna yeah. grow. Yep. And allowing yourself to push yourself to those limits. You're not allowing yeah. anything to become an excuse or a, an option out. Like truly yeah. understand how you can hone that in and then make it work for you. Like, um, you know, so I got, uh, last year I did worlds. I did, uh, I did worlds in Las Vegas uh, as a, uh, and I, and I did very well. So every competition prior to that, I did double golds, golds. I was crushing it, crushing it. Right. And then, um, to backtrack to what I said about my mom reappearing 27 years later, you know, my mom reappeared literally 20, she found me on Facebook. And first thing she wanted was money. Okay. Mm. So 12 year old kid, 37 at this point, 37, mm-hmm. 38. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, what the fuck just happened? Right. Mm-hmm. And I've already mourned the death of my mom. I thought she was dead. Yeah, yeah. I mourned it yeah. I moved on. I moved forward and that was it. And then to have that reappear is like reigniting that 12 year old kid. 
And it, it is like a form of like, I want to say PTSD, but it is a form of like, it's a shock to the body. It was, it was it's really a weird. It's a trigger. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A trigger. Yeah. It was a really weird thing, dude. And it was never the same after that. In two years into the relationship, all she ever wanted was money. So, and, and I'm over here, I'm a protector too. Like, like I said, I'm an alpha. I'm a, I'm a protector of my family. I'm a protector of my daughters. Uh, she wanted to meet my daughters. I, she still was into her old ways. So I was like, you know, kept them at bay. Didn't make a small introduction, but was always protected. So with her, we were like, I was cordial and I understood she was there. And, and we tried to develop a relationship again. It just didn't happen, right? And then, unfortunately, literally a week before Worlds uh, Jiu-Jitsu tournament in Las Vegas, which I, I was prepping all year for, dude. Like, literally, yeah. I, was, I was like, I'm taking Worlds. Okay? In my mind, I'm fucking taking Worlds. And it, and if you take Worlds, I mean, that's that's pretty top dog shit. And, uh, uh, you know, my mom passed away. And she uh, she called me the night before. And I, I ignored the call mm. and it, it, it was, uh, it was difficult, dude, because you know, that could have been the last time I talked to my mom, but at the same token, I look back and I always, I'm a man of faith, you know, I believe in God and I believe that that's my higher power. And, uh, I prayed about it. And I think, you know, I think that was, the, that didn't happen by accident. And I decided to not pick up the phone call because, you know, maybe what I was about to hear, I didn't want to hear as the last words because yeah. I knew her old ways, right? So yeah. I let that be. And literally, it's a week before world. I, it was almost like reigniting that morning again. But this time, like, I've already mourned before. So I was like, I felt very guilty for like a brief 24 hours. Like guilty, like, oh, fuck, what the fuck did I just do? And I almost called my professor and told him I wasn't going to make it. You know, I'm going to take some time to relax, mourn, and, and, and do what I got to do. And instead, the next day, I was like, I've been fighting my whole fucking entire life. What's, what's the difference now? here? Yeah. What's the difference now? It's like, I used wrestling to save my life. I'm going to use jujitsu to save my life again, because I don't yeah. want to fall back to this victim mentality of like, I just let my mom down again or whatever that may be. Right. Because yeah. you can let your mind really fuck with you. You can really, yeah. really, met, you are your own worst person. Right. right. Um, so I went and I competed and I ended up taking uh, third in my class and second in, in, in the, uh, in the open, dude, I went against, uh, fuck, I got DQ'd in the open, dude. <laughs> Stupid mistake. <laughs> I, I wanted to kill the guy, you know? He was, he, so, so I just got done beating two guys prior to him. I got, I got done with the uh, heavyweight and I'm, uh, I'm a, a middle heavy. So I'm 189 okay. pounds, you know, with my gi, 190. Yeah. And, um, uh, I make it to the finals in the open. I was like, I'm going to redeem myself because I, you know, I took third in the uh, in the uh, in my class, and and that was my own stupid mistake. I let my mind get to me, and so I I learned. I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to showcase myself in the open. I made it to the finals, dude. Dude was 333 pounds. Ooh. Big old dude, bro. Big Ooh. old dude. And uh, and I have this uh, this uh, they call it the self made choke because I, I I literally get it on everybody from the guard from the mouth from wherever and uh, I was I was in the position I had his lapel I was in the position he had my gi he had a grip and I deadlifted him dude it's in my uh, Instagram and Facebook I deadlifted him he was literally like five feet off the ground and I had the lapel to go around his neck. So I was shooting for his neck. He let goes of the gi and goes backwards. So that forward momentum looks like I slammed him, you know, uh. and, 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 and bro, and I was up on points. And so forward momentum goes and he just goes into this, like, Oh, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> he pulled it. Uh, he pulled a soccer player. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, bro. I was like, no, you know, and uh, and of course they DQ me. And as soon as we walk off the match, he's fine. He's like, hey, it's been into that, you know. This is um, <laughs> that was a lesson learned. It, it's so fucked up, but it was a good lesson that you know. Again, I challenged myself, and you know how good I felt after that. Uh, of even you know my mom passing, I I just felt like. This is how I challenge myself and put myself in uncomfortable yeah. situations to really see what I'm made of. So nothing in life that ever happens uh, it could ever be really so pivotal where it just destroys you. It's either going to yeah. make you or it's not, you know, and, and, yeah. and we as humans understand that power. We need to understand that power that we have. And it takes understanding these hardships and really looking at your life as a whole, even if you're right now still playing that victim card. 
snap out of it. Look at your life. Say, okay, how can you use all that turmoil and setbacks and hurdles to leverage these next amount of years ahead forward? That's right? that's your fuel. That's your fuel, man. One hundred percent is fuel. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where I'll never, uh, I, I'll never take any of that for granted because it's one of those things, like you said. What would I change? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, dude. And until this day, and even then, look, I got divorced. You know, this business and my sobriety. I decided to get sober uh, after Father's Day weekend. I had a binger and I decided it's like, I'm going to become just like my dad. I'm like, mm. I'm going to be, I'm going to fuck up my life just like him. And um, it was just a light switch, dude. That's one thing. It's like, if I, if I say I'm done doing something, that's it. And I don't repeat my mistakes twice. I understand that I learned from the mistakes to not let those happen again. And that's who created the success I am today. So again, the mistakes that anybody has done in the past, don't repeat them. Like understand how to stay away from I'm those signs. You'll see them. I'm curious when you got so when you got sober eight years ago, how much? How what was? If I looked at a bar chart for success and money and everything, what happened after that? No, oh, bro. You're. I mean, it went whoosh, skyrocket. Like literally skyrocketed. I'm focused. I well, no, take that back. I'm not just focused. I finally, I'm finally able to truly say I love myself and I respect myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't respect myself because I blamed whether it be myself or my surroundings for some of the shit that happened to me in the past. And I didn't know I had that in me. Like, I, I just thought I was like, oh, you know, you're masking it with all kinds of stuff. Limiting, li- limiting belief factors, doubt. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know, and I yeah. and I didn't love myself even though I've always been well presented, well well dressed, like man like in other words, hygiene's everything for me. Like I've always had that, but I didn't yeah. love myself. I didn't truly yeah. love myself. I I I was like, well, you, how can I love my how, my mom abandoned me? My dad got locked up, locked up and didn't care that we're homeless. I've had, you know, uh things just really fucked up happened in my life you know at 18 i find out that my dad was really not my dad when i went to go visit him in state prison for the first time because i had to go get my birth certificate at the county recorder's office and when i went to go get my birth certificate to get an id to go see him dude um there was another name on that uh birth certificate i was like who the fuck is this so automatically i call my 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 stepmom at the time you know that that kicked us out she's the only one that i had contact because i have no family contacted yeah. her and said, Hey, look, I know you don't like me. I know you hate me, but I just need an answer. And I was like, I just got my birth certificate to go see dad in, uh, in prison. And, uh, there's another, another name here. And I mentioned his name and he was like, she was like, she just smirked. And she was like, I thought you knew I hung up. I was like, what the fuck, bro? What the fuck, bro? And so come to find out he was never my real dad. He just raised me because of uh, my mom, you know, but my brother is his real father. So that was another thing at 18 that I found out that just threw me for a, a loop, you know? And uh, again, it's just life is going to happen no matter what. At the end of the day, there's, I shouldn't be here. I should be in prison. I should be dead or I, I either close to overdosing or still heavily drug addict alcoholic. Um, and I decided to stop all that, you know, 70 years ago, but my life dramatically has increased. Look at, I've retained the business for more than four years. Okay. I've, uh, increased my net worth dramatically. I'm yeah. in a healthy, uh, an amazing relationship that I'm about to get married again, which I never thought I'd do that again. Right. And, um, but when you know, you know, and this is one of those things where that all comes from sobriety. And what the beautiful part is, even with my fiance to be, it's, she loves me for me. This, I'm not changing. I'm not evolving from this. Besides, in a positive light, you know, whether it be in business or personal development, but this yeah. is who I am. And now this is what I get to do. And my daughters love her, and and she loves my daughters, which is another blessing. I'm a a, a great role model for my kids, a true role model, not a hypocrite, right. you know, because right. self made again, self made created my sobriety in the beginning because I had that binger. I've already had a one year owning self-made the commercial location, self-made training facility inside the, the warehouse. And in that year, I'm promoting success through health and fitness. I'm promoting entrepreneurship through health and fitness, discipline, the eating, drinking, right? The whole fucking shebang. But yep. I felt so guilty and I felt like a hypocrite. I was like, who in the fuck is this guy? And I, every weekend, I was a weekend warrior, dude. Every Friday, 
I disappear. Go do a bunch of yeah. blow. Go do a bunch of drinking, like a, just stupid shit. And then come Monday, work like nothing happened. I was functioning. I was literally a functioning drug addict alcoholic. And after that Father's Day weekend of a binge, I'm over here in Lake Havasu on my boat with my kids, the whole deal. And I'm over here trying to find cocaine to do because I'm drunker than shit and I'm trying to sober up. I, I don't like being out of control. So that's why cocaine and, and, and alcohol went hand in hand because mm -hmm. I'd get drunk and then I'd do a couple of a couple lines and I'm back. Hey, yo, yo, we're good to go. Right. And uh, I, it's such a nasty cycle. And after that binge on the whole drive home, I'm over here feeling like a hypocrite. I'm about to go to work on, on Tuesday and, and promote this well-being and shit like this. Talk about, like, talk about living light, living right and blah, 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 blah. And yeah. Yeah. And, and dude, and then I haven't looked back since then. That was June 19th, literally right after Father's Day weekend. And, and it was I tried, one of the best I things tried, I did. I tried. Now I look at everything and I, you know, we do this with our coaching clients and everything. I'm like, listen, I'm not doing shit unless there's an ROI. Not a conversation, yeah. not yeah. a business deal, not a yeah. post. I'm not watching a movie, you know, yeah. that doesn't give me something. If it's, if, you know, I'll watch a cartoon with my kid, my son or something or something, movie with my wife, yeah. but that's, there's an ROI there. Right. But I'm not mm -hmm. doing nothing. I'm not doing nothing that doesn't give me a return on investment. I, I live in those same principles. I think most of us do that are successful yeah. that way. They, uh, they understand the value of time. Every hour is accounted for, dude. Like this is a, a an investment for even me doing this with you. I've been following you for a while. Say I found you through obviously what was going on through the pandemic. And then, yeah. you know, we clicked because you, you have uh, we're very like minded, you know, and yeah. you doing jujitsu. That was another like bonus for me because I got that. That motherfucker's real. You know, for some reason, you have like <laughs> yeah. a different respect for people in the sport. Right. You really do. Yeah, you really do. Yep. Because, and especially because uh, what you're a blue belt, two stripe blue belt, right? Still? Yeah, yeah. And dude, it's, it's, it's not easy. And we keep showing up. I, I tell, <laughs> yeah. I, I tell, I tell people, we're especially, at our, especially at our age, especially oh, at our age. Well, yeah. Especially going with the open and going with these kids and these little, yeah. little guys, you know, I was like, oh, come here. Let me show you that old man strength. It was like, whatever you want to call yeah. it, bro, I'm going to whoop your ass, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but right. all that, again, what is the rate of return that we're getting at it? You know, iron sharpens iron. We get to tell our stories. Yeah. We get to uh, to really inspire. Because motivation for me is just uh, a crock of shit. It's cool. I it get is. it. It's good to to start somewhere. It's and you like, need to start. That's where I know. tell them. I'm like, it's essentially you know, motivation is cocaine. They're like, woo, yeah. yay, yeah. And then, it and, just not, yeah. then you and then you feel like shit. How about 100%. how about just doing some doing consist consistency? How about some yeah. Discipline? Con some discipline, consistency, and consistency is such a. It's so easy. But it's so difficult, you know, because it, it's um, again knowing it who you are. It removes about. it removes the feeling based decisions. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, it doesn't really matter does. how like, and I talk about this with being a father. Like you work, you know, you're working hard, right? You come home, yeah. time for take the time to take your daughters out. Maybe the daughters, and I see this. You like, you gotta take the daughters to the store. They want to go here. They want to yeah. go here. Yeah. And you're probably exhausted. You've been talking all day, talking to people. Yeah. And it makes yeah. you tired. What do yeah. you do? Get your ass in the car. We're going to, we're yeah. going to here. Where do you guys want yeah. to do? Yeah. Cause it ain't about yeah. you. No. And that's why I think, again, we, we, we see eye to eye on that because it's, it's respected. Cause I understand what you're going through and you understand, like we can right. uh, empathize with each other of that, that what it takes, that grit. And you have to understand, yeah. look, we do this all day. And then I still got to go be super dad and I still got to be super husband. And I still got to, you know, like, it's, it's, um, that's I it. talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. I talked about it yesterday. Every, I hate this, this word from people that tried to find an excuse out to what can actually happen in their life. They're like, well, I, I can't find the balance in my life or I'm trying to balance <laughs> my life. I hate that word. I, 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 I hate, hate it, it with the passion. It's like, yeah. look, you will never find balance in your life. So you're just sending yourself to fail and quit because that balance is a far fetched thing, especially yeah. in this world. But what I will tell you is that you can leverage your life. And what I mean by mm -hmm. leverage is like leveraging every hour of the day and understanding yeah. if you leverage that, no matter what, there's going to be boundaries to the leverage. Like me, I have to operate off of like six, seven hours max of sleep, right? That's just the way yeah. I, I function. Some people can do four. Some people can do five. There's certain days I can only get five 
but it's okay. Those are certain days, but that's yeah. my, that's like my downtime period. Right. And then also like, I don't start my mornings typically, uh, especially when I have my kids till 9am when I don't have my kids, I can start it at seven because I'm up at five. I'm training. I do my bodybuilding training and then I start my work hours and then I work until I literally have to either go home or do certain things because I can leverage those hours of what I need to do at home, what I need to do in business, what I also need to do right. personally. Like my time for me personally, like my time, my time for training and jujitsu, I will not deviate away from. Because if, if you take those two, non-negotiable, non-negotiable, non-negotiable. non-negotiable. Will not do it. Will not do it. Why? Because if I don't do me, I'm going to be a very bad person to work with. Like, period. I'll go back to my old ways, you know? So yeah. don't take that away from me because then I can't be a good father. I can't be a good husband. I can't be a good business. Right. Man. You know, and some listen, people sacrifice that. that. Yeah. Some and people sacrifice that. Yeah. And then that's when, that's the, those are the guys, the guys that sacrifice that. Well, my, my wife needs me. My this, I can't do, I can't take care of myself. No, in 10 years, you'll be calling me going, Hey, my life's fucked up and I'm fucked up and I got to get right. And then we have to fix it. 100% bro. And the other fucked up part about it is they start making excuses like the dad bod or this or that. Like, yeah, th- that, it's like, uh, and, and even women do it too. You're like, well, I'm a mom now. It's like, nah, you know, you, you can yeah, squeeze my, an hour. My, my wife, my wife gets a lot of, a lot of, you know, Starky, you know, snarky comments from moms. We'll just wait till this. Yeah. And they, they always say, just wait until this. Wait till you have a kid. And she's like, now she has a kid. We'll just wait yeah. till the kid's older or just wait till, you know, whatever. And it's like, yeah, no, because still that, going to, still going, she just got her blue belt. She's still going to jiu jitsu. She's still that. training. She's training. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. There's, there's no, excuse no excuses. To it. There's no there's excuse. There's no excuse. There's none. There's, yeah. no, there's, you can find an hour a day to do you, even if it's, whether it be yoga, meditating, a walk outside, fuck it. Doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Because Something. then they'll transition to actually other things that you add. And that's one thing is like, you have to understand the boundaries of how to leverage your hours. That's it. You'll never yeah. find balance, but you'll have leverage that, and you can leverage right. that because you're in control of that. And that's based off of a decision. That's it. Like, right. It's in my calendar. This thing right here tells me what I got to do every day and I stick to it. And that's where it is. And same thing with my team members. We're all on the same. If my team member can't make it to an appointment and it's in the calendar, you better have a fucking very good explanation, not an excuse explanation, because once it's set in stone, it's set in stone and that's it. That's how we operate, you know? And as long as you get that, then you're able to produce what is needed. You can, you can be the visionary. You can be, the true entrepreneur and be able to leverage things and have a fruitful and fun life. Because I've met some yeah. entrepreneurs that are just literally killing themselves, you know, because uh, we've all, that's we've all, way. we've all, we've all been there. We've all yeah, been there, but totally. it doesn't have to be. But, but when you do the things that you're talking about, man, isn't life awesome? Amazing. Bro. When you're living, when you're living consistently, when you're living with intention, where you're living with things like everything's an ROI and people think that like, Oh, that's gotta be so hard. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. But it's, it, it makes your life so much better. You feel so much better than just this constant, like trying to catch up and just reacting and reacting and reacting to everything. Nah, it's one of those things where it's like, um, it's a fruitful life, dude. It really is. Yeah. And it, and it's, you're at peace and you're, you know, I get some stupid comments sometimes as like, when are you ever going to be happy? Because, you know, whether you be the things, I was like, you have to understand my happiness comes from process and from creating yeah. and from You're being, like, doing, am, and from I, doing, I am, I'm, I'm I ecstatic. Happy. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I'm ecstatic. I was like, oh, you're trying. It looks like you're just trying to fill in your voids with material things. I was like, no, do you know what it takes to get those material things? That's what you're forgetting. You're just seeing the thing. Yeah. But do you know how many years it got to get to that thing? And yeah. how strategic, yeah. how you have, again, assets and liabilities. Like I explained it to them and then they're like, Oh shit. Yeah, exactly. So I'm really happy, you know, and yeah. I'm truly blessed in many, many ways, even with all the hardship. Like I truly have a beautiful life. I have beautiful kids. I have a beautiful wife to be like, life is great, dude. You know, I got my, but, health. All, but, I, I, but that, that all takes effort. All of it takes oh, effort to be happy, to have all that. It, it, it's effort. It doesn't come naturally. I think that's what people are, you know, they're always looking for the quick fix. The hat, well, I get, I get, you got any tips, you know, any hacks, you know, tips and hacks. hacks? Like, hold, hold, hold yourself a fucking accountable. <laughs> Stop being, you know, yeah. don't listen to like Andy Priscilla states it best. Don't listen to that bitch inner voice. You know, you, you yeah. can't 
like just hold yourself accountable. The main thing is, it's like, um, I, I truly believe in manifestation. Like I've been manifesting yeah. the reason I've documented everything since the age of 12. And I'm kid you not. Like I have a photo album on every aspect. And the reason I like to state that because whatever I state, you can look back and you see what I'm talking about. Manifestation mm -hmm. is a real deal. It, it, they, they called, they called us the dreamers, right? That's what they yeah. would say. It's not daydreaming. Like anything that I've ever had in my life, I manifested. So one thing that you can start doing is what you speak and what you think will become a reality. So Fact. if you start practicing that as a hack in a sense, right? I, I don't ever use the word try because that's definitely going to give you an exit. Okay. Well, at least I yep. tried. Well, no shit you tried. That's what you wanted to do. But how about effort? How about consistency? Like keep yeah. fucking going, right? That will change certain things. Also thinking highly and positive every day i know it's hard yeah. especially like during the pandemic that was a true test for my sobriety to true test for my well-being and my mental health i can only imagine right dude we were tested but yeah. i saw the light when everything else was dark i saw the light i looked at the other perspective of what things can happen and be yeah. and also you know unfortunately obviously people did die we understand there was a thing but it wasn't like you know it's completely we can go on a whole nother tangent with that one. Okay. But yeah, yeah. one thing that we did learn is like the people that survived it in the sense of in business and in personal development, those are the real deal. You're the real deal. We're the real deal. Think about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because how many of them closed down? How many of them just gave up? How many of them just found, again, they went and did other things that they weren't, you know, uh, lined up to do because they're, they're preaching and promoting this whole thing. And now, completely different person so you saw the real people that's right well hey we're um we're running out of time so where can people find you so social media is always my my thing between facebook and instagram instagram self-made family inc self-made family inc and then uh miguel aguilar uh realtor under facebook and then our website for our, our franchises is self-made training facility uh, dot com and then you can find everything there from the apparel to the training facilities and locations to i also own an equipment company we provide all the equipment that goes into our facilities so those are top notch i manufacture all that ourselves and design a lot of it ourselves and uh yeah that's where you can find me dude that's awesome man go and everything that you, you guys are hearing him man he just he just spits fire all the time on social media all the time, so if, you're looking, yeah. if, you're, if you're looking for some value um, and you're looking for things and just, you want to surround yourself with people that are doing the thing, not that, you know, yeah. you surround yourself with losers. You're going to be a loser. You're surrounding yourself with winners. You're, if you have an, if you have social media, your feed should be nothing but winners. Like that's all yep. it is. Just winners, yep. winners, winners. What are they doing? And then fucking copy that shit. Yeah. Um, Mimic well, the well, great dude, to be great, bro. That's right. So dude, I, I cannot thank you enough. I look forward to coming out there and, uh, and, and linking up with you in person and learning that self-made choke. I think I need to, I yeah. think I need that one. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's, then, it's, it's, and, uh, it's awesome, bro. And I've never trained in one of your facilities and I'm dying to, I'm absolutely. You got to come to, out. So. Yeah. And, yeah. Any, anytime you're close to any of them, let me know. Dude. I'd love to have you. And then I'll love to link okay. up in person. Dude, that'd be, it'll be phenomenal. Definitely. Uh, awesome. iron sharpens iron right here. Well, hey, guys, you know the deal. Never quit, never surrender. Always forward, and we'll see you guys in the next episode.